Bibles, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm really struggling with this humidity, what it's 75% humidity, uh, I don't know how long it takes to get past it guys, <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, yeah, if you guys want to give me water, or just throw water at me, it'd be good. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the title of the sermon this morning, I'm not taking it from any of the verses. But the title of the sermon this morning is Church Discipline. Church Discipline. The reason I wanted to call it that rather than just a verse from the, from the passage is so if you ever wanted to look up, what did Kevin teach about church discipline again? You know, if we ever have to carry out church discipline, we can go back and look at this chapter, go back to this sermon, refresh our memories. And I think it's important, it's a very important topic because a lot of churches, when it comes to church discipline, are very coy, very quiet about it. Okay, they don't really open up to their members about people being disciplined or sometimes people leave the church and it's all hush-hush and rumours start. I'd rather be an open and honest church about what's going on. If there's ever a time where we actually have to carry out church discipline and kick someone out of the congregation, that everybody would be aware of that. Okay, not because we all want to laugh that person to scorn or anything like that, but it's so we know, hey, this person needs prayers, this person needs help. You know, and in light of what we're going to read in this chapter, hopefully this gives you some insight of how we ought to handle church discipline in the church. And, you know, we're also going through some of these sins. Let's have a look at this very quickly in uh, verse number 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one know not to eat. So on Thursdays, not every Thursdays, but we're going through, slowly we're going through this list of sins that will get you kicked out of church and we're going, to, going into detail about these sins. We're going into detail of what these sins do and how it destroys yourself and how it destroys the church congregation. Now I'm not going to go into any great detail about these sins. What I really want to cover this morning is the more the practical things about kicking someone out of the church, the practical things about church discipline. So I hope that it's a, it's a blessing to you, okay? But, uh, you know, I'm already uncomfortable as far as, you know, the weather is concerned. But this is, pretty, this is a pretty uncomfortable chapter as well. So hopefully, you know, we haven't got our normal nice leather seats. We, you know, it's, it's hot. We haven't got fans. We haven't got the air conditioner. And we've got a hot topic as well. So I'm hoping that everyone's just, just you know, <laughs> just, uh, you know, um, hopefully you need to be cooled off after the sermon. You know what I mean? So let's, uh, let's look at verse number one. Verse number one. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much, so much named, sorry, not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So look, the first thing, the very first verse out of this chapter ought to make you cringe, right? That it says there that it is reported commonly. So this was known by the whole church or just commonly known in the church that there was a man, there was a brother in the church who had taken his father's wife to himself, was committing fornication with his father's wife. That's pretty disgusting. That's pretty vile. That's pretty wicked. To the point where even Paul says, not even this sin is named among the Gentiles. I mean, not even the unbelieving world is committing such a sin. That is not something that's commonly you know, reported amongst the world, but it's commonly reported amongst this church. It's commonly reported amongst the Corinthian church. What a disgusting and vile sin. And I, I kind of think about how can this situation even come to be? Now, first thing I just want you to notice, I don't believe this is his mother. I think the, the, the fact that it says that his father's wife is more so probably his stepmother. You know, it's possible that his mother's passed away. His father's taken on a second wife. She's lived with them. And my only way to understand this is possibly the father's passed away now and they find themselves living together in this situation, the stepmother and the father's son. And, you know, he's pretty much taken her as his concubine, I suppose. And, you know, Paul says there is fornication among you. There's fornication among you. Uh, it's, I find this alarming, alarming that it's reported commonly in the church, that there seems to be no action being taken that this man is in such a wicked sin. Look at verse number two. Paul says, and ye are puffed up. He says to the church, you're puffed up. Why? Because they allow this sin 
to carry on in the church without carrying out church discipline, without making an example of this situation. He says, because you've done no action, because you accepted in the church, you are puffed up, you are prideful and have not rather mourned. So this church should have been mourning. This church should have been weeping about such a great sin in their church, but rather puffed up. They're more righteous than God himself. They're accepting of this sin, knowing full well that God would definitely not allow this amongst the presence of his people. Um, and then it says that he hath done, so pay attention to this, to this, to this uh, phrase here, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Had they mourned, had they wept, had they not been puffed up, they would have put this man away from among them. They would have made sure they carried out church discipline. They would have made sure they had kicked this man out of the church. But because they were so puffed up, because there were so many problems in this church, divisions among them, strife, envyings, all that kind of stuff, they put up with this sin. Okay? And let me tell you now, if this church ever becomes like the church in Corinthians, where it's divided, where there's strife, where there's arguments amongst members, where we're not united in one mind, we too will start to allow certain sins, certain wicked sins into this church. Okay? It's so important that we stand united as we've, we've read throughout the previous chapters in this, in this uh, book. So, you know, the right thing for this church to have done was to kick this individual out of the church. Verse number three. For I verily, so Paul says, I verily as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already. He goes, look, I don't even need to be among you. I'm absent from you. I'm away from you. I'm writing this letter, but I can already make judgment. I can already tell you what the correct uh, measure is, the correct judgment is for this man. And then he says, as though I were present concerning him that have, done so, that have so done this deed. You know, this isn't a difficult decision, okay? If we find someone in our church that's doing these great wicked sins that we see in this list, this ought not to be a difficult decision for us, okay? We, we, we can be absent from the body, we can be away from the church, and we would know full well that this individual needs to be kicked out of the church. The only reason it might be difficult is because it's a family member, it's a loved one. It's something we care about deeply. And that's why you ought to be mourning about it. If someone that we love in this church is committing a great sin, but it shouldn't be a hard decision to know, hey, this person needs to be taken out of the congregation. This person needs to be kicked out of the church. Okay, verse number four. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I just want you to notice that. This isn't just Paul. Okay, this isn't just Paul's view. This isn't just man's opinion as far as kicking someone out of the church. But it's in the authority, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So kicking someone out of the church isn't just some, the opinion of the pastor. It's not just the opinion of the church. It's not just the opinion of Paul, but it's the opinion, it's the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his power that we would need to, at some point, potentially, I hope not, but at some point, potentially, kick someone out of the church for the great sins they have done. So never have the mindset, and I've seen this in other churches, where a pastor has had to make that decision. A pastor has had to kick someone out of the church. And then, who does the congregation criticize? The pastor. That's who they criticize. They don't think, well, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ demands of them. They don't think that this is in the name and in the power of Christ that this person needs to be delivered out of the church for the destruction. Given over to Satan, the verse said there. Okay? This is something spiritual. This is something that the Lord Jesus Christ demands of. But I just want you to notice a few things here. Someone that is kicked out of the church for these wicked sins is being delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. That's pretty harsh. That's pretty hard. Okay, but it's the truth. Okay, if someone gets kicked out of the church, then spiritually they are being given over to Satan for Satan to destroy that person. I mean, that sounds, that sounds pretty hard. Now, I say that to you because you don't want to be someone that gets kicked out of the church. Okay, you don't want to be someone that has these sins in their life 
openly rebellion against God, you know, hiding this sin from the congregation, and then, you know, being found out and being kicked out of the church for Satan to do what he wants to you. I mean, that'd be pretty scary. Okay, that's number one. So, you know, you want to make sure if, if some of these sins are in your life or, you know, today or in the past at some point, that you find the power to overcome that sin. Okay, and that power is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, and uh, look, there's another concept that I want you to think about is that this man hadn't been delivered unto Satan just yet. Even though he was in this great sin, Paul says, look, you need to cast him out. You need to kick him out so that Satan is given the ability to destroy that person. That means, what does that mean? That means that the church of God, the house of God has a great blessing in it. That blessing is a spiritual protection from Satan himself. I don't know if you've ever considered that. But church, being in church, being a member of a church, being a regular attendee of church, provides you a spiritual protection from Satan. Okay, now we know that Satan goes about roaring as a, uh, as a lion, roaring and uh, seeking to, you know, wh whom he may devour. We know that, but there is a special protection for God's people that are assembled in the church. Okay, now I bring that to your attention because you don't want to be someone that forsakes the assembling of yourselves together. You don't want to be someone that skips church on purpose for no reason whatsoever. I know there are legitimate reasons to not be in church. I understand that. But you don't want to be someone like this person that gets kicked out of the church that, you know, you voluntarily say, you know what, I'm not going to church this week. I'm not going to be part of church, you know, because when you skip church one week, you know, it makes it easier to skip it the second week. It makes it easier to skip it that month. And before you know it, that, that protection, that hedge of protection, that spiritual protection of the church will be removed from you and Satan can have his way with you as well. And you're not even kicked out of the church. You're just voluntarily giving yourself over to Satan and his wickedness. Okay? So and I really appreciate that we have visitors today, right, from Papua New Guinea, because that concept is true. You know, wherever you, you, you travel and visit, you need to find yourself a church. Especially if you're going to be away for a long period of time, you want to find a congregation of believers knowing full well that there is a protective spiritual hedge in a church that I can attend. Okay? Now, the other thing that I want you to pick up here is even though this man was in great sin, even though this man's flesh is going to be given over to Satan to be destroyed, he's still a saved believer. Believe it or not, he's still a saved believer. Look at verse number 5 to deliver such and one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Was this person saved? Yes. Now, here's the thing. In a lot of churches, someone that's doing a wicked sin like that, guess what they're going to be saying? He's not saved. Ah, oh, yeah, I mean, for him to be doing such a wicked sin, that man cannot be saved. But what do we find here? that a believer can also do these great and wicked sins. Why? Because we still have the flesh, right? This man had, had, not, had not been walking in the spirit. You know, he'd been walking according to the flesh. You know, he, had, he hadn't been crucifying that flesh daily. And, you know, he was bringing this sinful, you know, this sin amongst, upon himself. But his spirit is saved. And I want you to pay attention to the words because I don't want you to misunderstand what it says here. It says that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What is the day of the Lord Jesus? It's the rapture, right? Many references in the Bible talking about the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the rapture. So it's not saying here, because some people have read this and say, well, hold on. Maybe he's being given over to the devil so that he would be, that he, he would be saved. You know, some people have said that because it kind of sounds like, it says that he, like the spirit may be saved. So it's kind of like potentially he's not saved now, but there's a future salvation for him should he be under the attack of the devil and then, you know, repent and turn to Christ or something like that. But it's not, it's not saying that. It's saying that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because at the rapture, he's going to receive his resurrected body. At the rapture, he's going to receive that body which does not struggle with sin. That, that body which is perfect, that is, is not corrupted, that is immortal, and so he's in the flesh right now. This flesh, you know, uh, Lord willing, will be destroyed by the devil, but the spirit would be saved for that new resurrected body. That's what it's teaching here. 
that he, that spirit would be saved for that day so he would receive his new resurrected body and no longer be oppressed by the sin that he has upon himself. I mean, that just proves that this man was saved because he's going to be raptured on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to receive his resurrected body. Okay? So again, never judge someone's salvation just because of their sin. You know, I mean, even a sin as wicked as this. You know, don't think, oh, we've got to cast him out because he's an unsaved devil and we never want to see him again because there is a time for him to be reconciled and we see that later on in, Second Corinthians, in the book of 2 Corinthians. Um, now, it says here in verse number 6, well, actually, before I read verse number 6, I just want you to notice a couple of things here because verses 6, 7, and 8, I've often heard taken out of context. Okay, often when I hear verses 6, 7, and 8 preached, it's completely removed from this chapter. Okay, so the first thing I want you to notice is that verses 1 to 5, which we've already read, is about this man in fornication, right? It's about this man being kicked out and given over to Satan. Okay, but then verses 9, if you want to look at verse number 9, it says, I wrote unto you in an, ex in an epistle not to company with fornicators, and then we continue reading to verse 13, where again, it's talking about, you know, uh, kicking people out of the church. Okay, so verses 1 to 5 is about kicking someone out of the church. And verses 9 to 13 is about kicking someone out of the church. Now, sandwiched between those verses are verses 6, 7, and 8. So I, the reason I say that to you is, again, because I've heard 6, 7, and 8 completely removed from the context. And I'm going to explain that to you a bit later. But... I believe verses 6, 7, and 8, you know, is, it's not a coincidence that it's sandwiched between these passages because it, it continues the same thought. It's about the same thing. Okay, look at verse number 6. Your glorying is not good. Why were they glorying? Because they were puffed up. That's what he's saying. Your glorying is not good, the memory verse. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. What are we talking about here? What are they glorying? What are they puffed up about? The fact that they allow this man in the church to be involved in such great fornication, such great wickedness. Then it says, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. What is leaven? It's like yeast. It's an old, it's an, uh, old leaven is, is like an old fermented uh, dough that when you mix it with new dough, it rises just like yeast does for bread. It rises the bread, right? So it's soft and fluffy. That's how people generally like to eat bread. So he uses this example of this man and his great wickedness and this man is the one that's been described as the little leaven. Because if you allow a wicked person like that in the church, guess what? It'll spread to the whole church. If you allow a church, if you allow wicked people in your church committing great sins that is commonly reported, reported everybody knows about it and yet everyone's accepting of it, guess what? It's going to taint every person in the church. Everybody will say, well, hold on, that person can be part of the church. Look at the great sin that he does. Hey, I can, I can dabble in a little bit of that sin myself. You know, it's fine because that's the influence of sin. People that are involved in sin want others to also be involved in sin. Okay. For some reason, people find like a, like a justification, you know, oh, I'm, I'm struggling with this sin. But if everyone's struggling with this sin, then it's okay. And that's, that's what happens to a church. If you allow a little leaven, a little wicked, that wicked person to coexist with everybody else in the church service, they're going to influence everybody in a negative way. And of course, we can take a practical, personal application to this as well. Of course, we can say, hey, if we allow a little leaven, a little sin in our life, yes, it can leaven the whole lump. Hey, that's why we ought to be walking in the Spirit. That's why when we do sin, we ought to be confessing our sins to the Lord Jesus Christ and maintaining a good fellowship with Him keeping a short account with God. Yes, we're going to sin every day. Yes, we're going to be wicked. Yes, we still have this old flesh. But, you know, ensure that that leaven is taken out of you when you sin by confessing those to Christ and asking Him to forgive you. Okay? But I want you to understand the context. The context of this is the church. The little leaven is that wicked man that was going to taint the whole church with his sin. All right. Now, look at verse number 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Purge out. What does that mean? Get rid of it. What are we talking about? Kicking people out of the church. Do you understand how keeping this in context helps understand the passage? Helps understand these verses. Purge out the old leaven. Purge out that fermented... Because, you know, leaven, many times in the Bible, is a picture of sin. Not always. 
It's also a picture of the kingdom of God. It, it can be used in a positive sense, but many times it's used in a negative sense. In fact, Jesus Christ mentions it a couple of times about the leaven of the Pharisees, uh, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's sin. Purge out therefore the old leaven or kick the guy out of your church that ye may be a new lump, a lump without that leaven, as ye are unleavened. But then look at this. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now, this is what I mean by people taking things out of context. Because verses 6, 7, and 8, people, I've, I've heard preachers say this. They take those passages and say, well, this is about the Lord's Supper. This is about us partaking of, um, you know, the, the grape juice and the unleavened bread. And they take these passages to teach on the Lord's Supper. But it's actually about kicking someone out of your church, if you keep it in context. Do you see how... How, uh, you know, you can look at a passage and, and come to a different conclusion and why it's so important to make sure when you read your Bible, you read the whole book, read the whole chapter, read the verses surrounding a passage because it's going to enlighten your understanding of what God's primary ap application is for those verses. And look, the Bible is so deep. There's always secondary applications. There's always third applications and fourth applications. You know, the Bible is like, it just, you, can, it just, you just continue unraveling it. You know, the more you read it, the more you understand it, the more you see correlation between verses, the more deep you're going to get into the, in the Bible. But never forget the primary application, because that's the key thing that God wants us to understand. Okay? But, uh, so, Christ, our Passover. Now, you guys ought to know what the Passover is, I think. Okay? That's one of the, one of the most basic teachings that you get about the Old Testament. That Passover, if you remember when Israel was, was still in, in, when the children of Israel were still in Egypt and the Lord was going to deliver them out of Egypt, the last plague that the, that the Lord does on the Egyptians is to kill all the firstborns, all, all the firstborn. You remember that? Whether it was man or whether it was cattle. But for the Jews to be protected or for the Israelites to be protected from that, uh, that punishment, they were to take a lamb. And actually, you know what? Let's read it. Let's go there. Uh, let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Let's read it. Exodus chapter 12. Keep a finger in 1 Corinthians 5 if you can and go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month shall, uh, they, uh, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. So this was a practice to be done once a year on this first month of the year. Verse number four. And if the household... Be too little for the lamb. Let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So if your family is a smaller family, you can actually invite your neighbors to come and partake of the Passover together if the lamb's too much for one family. Okay. Now, uh, uh, sorry. Well, what verse was I on, guys? Verse number five. Verse number five, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And it's important that the lamb was without blemish because Christ is our Passover lamb. We just read that in 1 Corinthians chapter five, okay? So Christ was without sin. And so the lamb had to represent something that was pure and good and without blemish, without any sin. A male of the first year, you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until, up until the 14th day of the, of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So the Passover was to take place in the 14th month of the first year. Once a year. Verse 7. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side, on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night. Roast with fire and unleavened bread. Remember that unleavened bread? What did we read about? We, that was covered in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as well, right? The unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs they shall eat it. 
eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. That means, sodden means it's an old word for boiled with water. So don't boil it. But roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. Pertinence is like, you know, all the organs, all the guts as well. You know, roast the whole thing. Eat not of it raw. Oh, sorry, uh, verse 10. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. So you've got to eat, eat, eat it that, that day. And if there's anything left over the next day, you just burn the whole thing. You, you don't eat it again. Okay. And of course, what does that picture? The fact that Christ was crucified once for sin. Okay. You partake of it once and then whatever was left should be destroyed. It's not going to be eaten again because Christ laid his, laid his, laid his life down once. Okay. Now, um, uh, verse 11, And thus shall you eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's what the Passover represented. Is that when God sees the blood of the Lamb, He will make sure that the Israelites will not be hurt by this plague. He will pass over them and will instead hurt those that do not have the blood. That is a picture of our Savior. That is a picture of the shed blood of Christ on the cross when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are clean from all your sins. Right? You're, you're cleansed through the blood of Christ. And when God looks at you, if you, if you put your faith on Christ, He will pass over you in judgment. He will not judge you because the blood of Christ has been spilt and His righteousness is upon you. And we see this type, we see this picture in the Old Testament, picturing or, or pointing people to Christ, having that object lesson so they would understand that in the future, there would be one to come that would fulfill this. It's a symbolism of Christ and his blood. Um, and the blood shall, sorry, verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses. I read that already. Where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Okay. Now, I want you to notice verse 14. It's the last verse that we're going to read in this chapter. Verse 14. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. So what's the Passover? It's a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast. Pay attention to that phrase, okay? And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast. So he says it twice. You're going to keep this feast. You're going to keep this feast. You shall keep it as a feast by an ordinance forever. Now what's forever? Does it ever end? It's eternal. The Passover is a feast to be kept forever, right? Now, I want you to just, just keep that in mind. And I'm going to just go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because I want to first explain to you my understanding of this passage, okay? Keeping it in context. And then I'm going to show you how other people have different views, okay? Just, just for your information. Just for your information. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse number 8. Now remember that phrase. Look at verse number 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Isn't that what we just read in the Old Testament, in the Exodus? That, that they are to keep that feast forever. And now Paul is saying to the church, therefore let us keep the feast. What, does that mean on the 14th day of the first month that we need to be doing the Passover like they did? Like take a lamb without blemish, invite the neighbors over, you know, you know, you take the, the blood and put it on the doorpost. Is that what we're meant to be doing? No. How do we keep the feast of the Passover in the New Testament? Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven. What was the old leaven? The wicked man in the church that was to be kicked out, right? Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice. What's malice? It's uh, intent to cause harm and wickedness. That's something that's exceedingly sinful, exceedingly bad, okay? But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What's sincerity? Being honest and without compromise. Truth, obviously, um, 
uh, sorry, no, sincerity is being genuine and not hypocritical. Okay? God wants us to be a church that's genuine and not hypocritical. Okay? Because if we're preaching against sin and yet we allow a wicked man like this in our church, that's being hypocritical. Okay? And uh, bread of sincerity and truth. Truth is to be honest without compromise, okay? Being open and honest about things, okay? So if we ever kick someone out of the church, I'm going to be someone that tells you the honest truth why that person's been kicked out of the church, okay? Because we don't want to hide it and then let rumors spread and make things worse than they ought to be. But I just want to show you how is the Passover kept? This, this is a type, Old Testament type. We know the lamb represents Jesus Christ. But what does the unleavened bread represent? A a, a pure, true, and sincere church. And the old leaven represents the man or the person in the church that ought to be cast out of the church so they don't leaven the whole lump. Do you see that? Do you see how the type in the Old Testament fulfills how a New Testament church ought to practice you know, church discipline? And again, like I said, some people take these verses and say, well, no, that's about the Lord's Supper. But hold on, is he even talking about the Lord's Supper? In fact, it's chapter 11 we react, Paul actually teaches, and we won't go there, but it's chapter 11 that Paul teaches on the Lord's Supper to the Corinthian church. It's, it's many chapters later where he covers that topic. Okay? Now, so how do we keep the feast? How do we keep the feast of the Passover? Well, Christ, right? Christ is our Passover, and it's something to be kept forever. So if you put your faith on Christ, guess what? Christ is your eternal Passover. Christ is our Passover. Okay? You've put your faith in Christ. That is you keeping the feast of the Passover. And as a church, keeping ourselves unleavened, when there is leaven, the old leaven, the wicked man, we need to cast that person out of the congregation. Okay? Within the context of this chapter. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this taught before. Okay? I haven't. Okay? But as, as I study this chapter, you cannot remove these verses away from the rest of what's going on here. And notice how important how, the, the words... So it said in verse number eight, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Now, if you look at verse number uh, 13, verse number 13 in the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13, look at this. But them that are without, God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So what's the wickedness? The wicked person that we need to cast out, the old leaven that we need to get rid of in the church. Now, let me say this. Um, there are some people, some, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing these pastors, I'm not criticizing these churches. I just want to make you understand how we can, you know, genuine saved believers can look at the same passage and come to a different conclusion. Because some people will look at this and say, well, we're to keep the feast of the Passover. And they associate this with the Lord's Supper. Now, I, I, I do not believe the Passover, the, the, the feast of the Passover has anything to do with the Lord's Supper. You know, the Lord's Supper where we take part of the, the, the juice, the grape juice and, and the unleavened bread. I don't, believe, I don't believe the Lord's Supper is a continuation of the Passover. I don't believe it's, it's the Passover in the New Testament. Though there are some similarities, and those similarities is the fact that they point back to Christ. Okay? Point back to Christ's sacrifice. And that's pretty much the only similarity. But when you have types in the Old Testament, and they've been fulfilled, then it's done away with. And the worst thing is when Christians go and think, hey, we need to keep the Passover. We need to go and celebrate, get together and, and partake of an Old Testament practice and think, well, God still wants us to keep the Passover because they read this chapter and said, well, it says to keep the feast. Yeah, but you've totally removed it from the context. All right. And they, they partake of the Lord's uh, Passover and they think they're doing God a service. They think they're praising God. They're not because Christ has come. And what was a type, what was a picture of Christ, Christ has come and fulfilled that. And Christ, I don't know if you've heard this term before, Christ is the antitype. When you see types in the Bible, it's to point to the antitype. When you see Israel going through the Red Sea, and that's called the baptism, that's a type of the New Testament baptism, you know, where we, we, we uh, you, know, um, you know, immerse in the water and rise out of the water. That was a type, and the New Testament baptism is the antitype. The type was the Passover, and the antitype is Christ and his crucifixion. Okay? Don't waste your time with types. Okay? Don't think that I need to do the old types, the old feasts, uh, to please the Lord. No, you just need to put your faith and trust in God. You put your faith and trust in Christ and his sacrifice. That's you keeping the Passover. 
That's you keeping the Passover for all eternity. Okay? And another example is the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day. I don't know if I've got a, a reference to that. Um, because people read these passages and they think they need, to, they need to continue keeping these things. Let me just see if, I've, if I uh, actually took down that... Um, So just bear with me. Oh, yeah, yeah, I did. I actually did. Exodus chapter 31, verse 16. I'll just read it to you. Exodus 31, 16 says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. What's perpetual? It's continuing. It doesn't end. Okay? It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So hold on, are we meant to be observing the Sabbath day? You know, the Seventh day Adventists, for example, believe, hey, we've got to keep observing the Sabbath day because God said it's forever. Yeah, but you've not read the book of Hebrews, right? Hebrews chapter 4, where it says that the Sabbath day is a representation of what Christ has done for us. That the resting on the Sabbath day represented a rest from our works for salvation. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath rest. And Jesus Christ is the antitype to the type of what the Sabbath was. And then people say, well, hold on. We still see the Sabbath being mentioned in the New Testament. Yeah, because that's what they call Saturday. Okay? It's Shabbat in the Hebrew. I'm going back to the Hebrew. Sorry, guys. Shabbat. They, they, that's what Saturday is. Okay? So when you read Sabbath in the New Testament, it's because it's Saturday. That's what, that's what they're saying. It's not saying that they're observing the Sabbath. It's just that they're probably meeting on, the, on, the, on Saturday or they're doing some works for the Lord on Saturday. It's fine. Okay? Because the fulfillment of the Sabbath was Jesus Christ. Okay? Let me give you just a, an analogy of this, a real life analogy. So obviously Christina's pregnant with our 10th child and we've got some ultrasound pictures and every now and again Christina looks at those ultrasound pictures because you know, she wants to see you know, what her baby might look like and just have a look at the face. You know, is it like the other kids? You know, who, who, who might he look like? But do you think after she goes through labour and delivers that baby, do you think she's going to grab those ultrasound pictures and go, oh, my baby? Or do you think she's going to grab the newborn and, and hug the newborn and kiss the newborn and praise the newborn? Well, what do you think she's going to do? Is she going to go for the, the type or is she going to grab the antitype, the real baby, and, and celebrate and hug that baby? Do you think she's going to take those ultrasound pictures and say, my baby's here? you think I'm going to post pictures on Facebook of the ultrasound pictures after the baby's born? Right? No. Once the baby's here, that's the main thing. Well, the, the ultrasound pictures don't matter anymore, <laughs> okay? It's just a foreshadowing, it's just a picture of what was to come, which is that newborn child, all right? Or what if Samuel turns one, when does he turn one? Next month. Samuel turns one next month. Let's say, you know, like birthday parties, you do a cake and presents. Do you think Christina's going to, you know, when we're going to sing happy birthday to, to, to Samuel, do you think she's just going to bring photographs of Samuel? And say, all right, say, let's sing happy birthday to Samuel. Look at his photos. No, you'll be like, well, where's Samuel? Like, we're singing to him. Let's, let's get Samuel here, right? That's, you know, I mean, that sounds stupid, right? That's how stupid it is to go back to the Old Testament types and celebrate and worship that in that way when the Lord Jesus Christ has already come and we need to have our eyes upon him and not the, not the types of the Old Testament. If you ever get invited, hey, I'm going to have a Passover feast. Would you like to come? Just say, no, I've got Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, and we have the New Testament ordinance of how to look back at his sacrifice, which is the Lord's Supper, okay? But uh, I just want to show you how people can take these passages, right? And they say, well, see, the Passover was done once a year, and so the Lord's Supper ought to be done once a year, okay? That's where they get it from. That's where they get it from, because they, they think of it as a continuation of the Passover rather than thinking, well, hold on, now Christ was the Passover lamb, and that has been fulfilled. And again, I'm not criticizing, because look, if, if God wanted us to do it a certain way, you know, the Lord's Supper, you know, do it this many times a year, or He would have told us. Okay, He leaves this open for every church to make a decision about that. You know, some churches have a closed uh, communion policy or a closed communion policy. We here have an open communi communion policy. And let me tell you, don't make that a big problem. Don't make that the issue. Okay, you know, I've heard people say, you know, I'm not going to this church because they do closed communion. Are you serious? Is that what you're going to base your fellowship with? Because that church does closed communion, so I'm not going to partake of that. I mean, I've heard Christians say that when they've got a good church to go to, and yet they don't want to be part of it because of the way they do communion. 
But I just want to show you how people can take this verse and I can understand why they do things a certain way. I can understand why they interpret things a certain way, uh, even though I disagree with it, but I can understand and yet I will give them the benefit of that. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing that you're going to understand. The kind of people that you ought to... Feel, like we're talking about... This all ties in together, right? We're talking about kicking people out of the church, people that we ought not to fellowship with. Who are the people that we ought to fellowship with? Who are the people that we ought to be in company with? Well, first of all, let me give you some ideas. People that have the right gospel, people that have the right Jesus Christ, people that have the right spirit, okay? If someone comes to you with another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, those people are not people you ought to fellowship with. That's not a church that you ought to be part of, okay? That's number one. Now, if they've got the right gospel, great. What else would you like in a group of people? That they're King James only, that they believe that God has given us a preserved word of God, pure, without error, okay? Especially if you're looking for a church, you want a church that is doing soul winning. And look, here's the thing. If that church is not doing soul winning, then if you've got no other option, you go soul winning, right? But you want to make sure that you're in a church where the pastor will support you. And even if you're the only one doing it, that they're not against soul winning. Because that's the first works that the Lord Jesus Christ has left us. That's the great commission that the Lord Jesus Christ has left us. Okay, so we've got the right Jesus. We've got the right spirit, right gospel. We've got the King James. We've got a good church. Now what? Well, does this church allow wicked people that we see in this list? Is this church made up of people that are, what does verse um, 11 say, that are fornicators, covetous, idolaters, railers, drunkards, and extortioners in the church? Are they allowing those people in their church? Well, if they do, that's, probably, that's not the church you want to be in. Why? Because that leaven's going to leaven you. That leaven's going to leaven the whole lump, okay? Now, these are the things that you need to be mindful of when you choose your friends, when you choose your fellowship, when you choose your church, these are the things, okay? These are the things that you should divide over, okay? But are you going to divide over how people do communion? Are you going to divide over these doctrines where people read passages and come with a different, even though I disagree with them, do you think that's going to cause me to break fellowship with people? And yet that's what I see. And that's what I see. I see people not wanting to go to this church because they've interpreted this passage differently than they, you know, even though the church is the right gospel, even though the church teaches from the King James Bible, even though the church is, is pure and unleavened and doing the best they can to serve the Lord, they'll find some issue and say, well, I don't want to be a part of this church because of what they teach about this. And yet, what do they do? They go with their mates, they hang out with their drunkard friends, their fornicating friends. That is hypocrisy. When you look at your brethren and you decide to create divisions over things that are trivial or things that are secondary or tertiary in nature, and yet you go, well, I don't have any fellowship. I'm going to hang out with my worldly mates. I'm going to hang out with my friends that are drunkards and fornicators. That's fine because they're not saved. That's not fine. And we'll read later on that you're not even to company with people like that that are in the world. Okay? And that's why we ought to not have people like that in our church. We ought to kick them out. What does Jesus say about... Um, I don't know if I've got the reference, but he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Um, I think it says, which is hypocrisy. Okay, which is, and that is, that is hypocrisy. When you have, when you're saying, hey, like, you know, this church differs a little bit here, I'm not going to be part of it, but then you go hang out with your worldly mates that are all into all these kind of sins. That is hypocrisy. Don't divide over non-essential matters. These are the key things. The right Christ, the right gospel, the right spirit, an unleavened church that's serving the Lord, that's King James only, and doing the soul winning. That's what you want in a church. You've, if you've got that, you're doing a lot better than many people out there. Okay? If you've got that, you're blessed. Okay? Now, let's go on to verse number... Yeah, are you still in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go to verse number um, 9. Verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So Paul is saying, look, I, I've written to you in the past. This isn't my first letter to you. Even though it's called 1 Corinthians, there was a letter previously that he wrote to them. Okay. Um, so I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Verse number 10. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, nor with the, uh, the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Okay? So we ought not to be making friends with the unsaved people who commit these sins. Okay? Oh, but they're better friends than people in church. 
you know, you're, you're not meant to company with them. Okay? They may be better friends. They, they may very well be. But the command of the Lord is not to be their friends, not to fellowship. And, and I know there are situations where you can't help it. I know we need to be in work. I know we need to be in the, out in the, in, in the world from time to time. And I know we have family members that are not saved. And I know, I know you know, I, I understand there are some things you cannot help. You know, you're, you know, there might be a work function that you need to be part of for whatever reason, okay? And, and there might be drunkenness going on or whatever, okay? Now, if you can avoid it, avoid it. But I know sometimes, you know, your work requires you because it is a work function or whatever, okay? But as much as is in you possible, don't company with these kind of people. These are worldly people. And then verse number 11. Verse number 11. But now, so in this letter, Corinthian church, now I have written unto you, not to keep company if any man is called a brother. So a, someone that is saved, someone in the church that is a brother or a sister, someone that is saved. And look, does Paul need to say this to them? He's already written to them that they shouldn't be, you know, fellowshipping with these kind of people in the world. I mean, shouldn't you think, well, even more so in the church? And yet Paul has to tell them, look, I have to tell you, I have to write to you now, not just the world, but your brethren. You're saved, brothers and sisters. Uh, I'll just read it again. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such and one know not to eat. So I'm not going to go into any great details about this sin. Again, we're doing that on Thursdays. But a fornicator is someone that's committing sexual relations outside of the marriage. Um, and that, that obviously represents this man that's with his father's wife. Uh, covetous, people who desire um, or, or lust over material possessions. Uh, an idolater, someone that worships idols. A railer, you know, a person that ins insults or scoffs um, about, about somebody, you know, and, or, 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 or to somebody about somebody else. That's a railer. A drunkard, someone that's intoxicated with alcohol or drugs or just has lost control in that sense, you know, is, is not sober-minded. An extortioner, Someone that obtains something from somebody with threats or by force or by blackmail. That's an extortioner. We all want to have people like that in this church. Okay? Now, verse number 12. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. So we need to judge within, within our church. Okay? But them that are without, so those that are outside of the church, God judgeth. Therefore, therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay, that's the end of the chapter. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. That's the, that's the command. Yeah, that's the Bible teaching. It might seem harsh. And if we ever do that, yes, it's going to hurt. Okay, especially if you love that person. But that is the command of God because we ought to love God more than we love our brethren. You know, we ought to be doing his, wor his words and keeping his works um, rather than pleasing man, okay? Now, so there are certain people that we are commanded to kick out of the church. Now, what I want to talk to you about is just a practical thing. So if this happens in our church, and I want, I want you to, to know, okay, because I want you to hold me accountable as well. Okay, if we have someone in the church that has these sins and I allow it, you go, Kevin, remember that? Remember that, ver that chapter, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 5? You know, we need to keep each other accountable. And obviously there's, there's leadership within, uh, with me as well. But let me just say a couple of things here. If you're one of these people that has these sins in their life, I'm saying right now. I'm not saying in the past, okay? Now, let me just say this as well. I mean, this church is about five months old. I don't think it's even five months yet. It's about five months old. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, when this church started, it's a clean slate. I really don't need to know about your sins in the past. I don't need to know whether you were a drunkard, and I'm sure some of you were, uh, or a fornicator. I'm sure some of you have done that, or whatever. I don't, you know, as far as the church starting, it's a clean slate across the board. I'm not going to carry out church discipline for something you did five years ago, okay? Or something that you did six months ago, before the church started. Or if someone's a new person in the church, you know, and, you know, they've done something in the past, I'm not going to hold that against them, Okay? You know, we, we start, as far as this church, as far as I'm concerned, it's a clean slate. Now, we shouldn't be naive, you know, especially if there are people that have done some of these sins, that they're capable of doing that in their flesh. You know, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, uh, I'm going to watch over your souls. I'm going to make sure, 
you know, uh, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not completely ignorant of that, but I'm not going to call that person out as guilty having done something in the past, right? Now, this is a command for the whole church to kick this person out of the church. Obviously, I'm not going to know everything. And if you guys know somebody in the church that is in these sins, then you need to let me know about it. Okay, you need to let me know about it. But even better, even better than that, if you yourself are, are in this sin, any of these sins, then even better than that is you tell me yourself. You tell me, you know why? Because if you tell me and you come, you know what that tells me? That tells me that you're honest and you want to sort this out. Okay? And what was, what was the problem with this church in Corinthians? Is they were puffed up. And Paul says you should have been mourning. If you come to me and say, you know, pastor, you know, Kevin, brother, I struggle with this sin in my life to this day. You know what? I will mourn with you. I will weep with you. I will come and I will fast and pray with you. And we will seek the Lord's power to help you overcome that sin in your life. And I will help you put an action plan together to get this sin out of your life. Okay? And if we do all of that and you still fail then I'm going to have to kick you out. But at least I know you're trying. But if you're keeping it a secret and somebody in the church comes to me about it, I'm going to have to make diligent inquisition about it. Okay? Now, again, don't be someone that comes up with false accusations and a false witness. I don't want to hear that. Okay? Turn to, uh, let's see, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Deuteronomy chapter 19. Because the Bible has a process, okay? God's given us a process of bringing an accusation against somebody, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. It says this, One witness, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin, or in any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. So if I have one person come and says, you know what, um, I saw brother so-and-so stagger out of the pub, you know, drunkard, vomiting, that's one witness. You know, I'll, 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 I'll probably approach that brother and ask him, you know, but I can't really carry anything out. I mean, if he denies it, if he denies it, I've only got the one witness. But if I've got two witnesses, I've got three witnesses, then that matter can be established and then we can cast that person out of the church. Does that make sense? But one witness is not enough. You know, you can't come to me and say, well, you know, and let, let's, say, let's say the guy turns up completely drunk off his face to church and you say, Pastor Kevin, I told you. I told you. Well, no, it was one witness. <laughs> okay? It was one witness and we need to follow the, the, the law of God. But uh, look at verse number 16 because there is punishment for a false witness as well. Deuteronomy 19 verse 16. If a false witness... If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. That's what I mean by diligent inquisition. It's investigate this matter. Okay, investigate this matter if there's a false accusation especially. Um, and behold, if the witness... Of the false witness, sorry, if the witness be a false witness and have testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he hath thought to have done unto his brother, so shalt thou put the evil away from among you. So if you come to me and you falsely accuse, you're a false witness, you're trying to get someone kicked out of the church and you say, you know, so and so is in fornication. And that brother says, I'm not, that's, that's, a, that's a lie. And it's come, and we do diligent inquisition, we find that you've, you're a false witness, you're a false report, then you're the one that gets kicked out of the church. You get to, you, you, you suffer the consequence of trying to make, get someone else to be punished or, or, or go through that church discipline. Does that make sense? So we need to make sure if we're going to bring an accusation against someone, and we ought to when it comes to this list of sins, but that we make sure that it's solid, that it's true, okay? Not just some rumor. Okay, and I'll probably hear rumors anyway. There's always rumors. There's always rumors. But we need to make sure that it's a true witness or you're going to be the one that gets kicked out of the church. Okay, so that I just want you to understand the process. But even better, 
If you're in these sins, you come to me about it because I'll be more merciful. You know, I'll, I'll be willing to help you through that. And if, again, if, if, how does that work with the two witnesses? Well, here's the thing. If you've admitted that you're in that sin and I'm working with you to overcome that sin, there's the two witnesses. There's your, there's your witness and there's my witness, okay? But uh, you know what this reminds me of a little bit as well? I used, to, I used to work, I used to employ a lot of people and sometimes employees would slack off and they wouldn't be pulling their weight. And so, you know, commonly people are like, ah, oh, just sack them. Well, hold on, no. I mean, they've got the training. You know, they're, they've been a good worker in the past. Maybe they just need a little help. And we put them on a, on, a, on a program to help them get back to where they ought to be. You know, let's, we give them a month, for example. You know, at the end of this week, I need you to do this, have this much productivity. At the end of this week, you know, this much. And you need to get to the point where you're back on, on board, where you're back, you know. I'm willing to work with you because I don't want to lose you and then get someone else and train them and go through all that process again. And you know why that's so important? Is because that person truly knows that, you know, their pastor loves them. Truly knows that person's willing to work with them and help them to get past this sin. And if you get past it, praise God, you can continue being a member in the church. But let's also be merciful to people that are new Christians. You know, people are doing these sins all the time. They get saved. They don't, a lot of them don't know about these, that these things are great wicked sins. And so if they come to the church or they're new to the church, and yet we know they're in these sins, just, just be patient, be merciful. You know, give me the opportunity as well to be able to talk with these people and let's say, let's say a boyfriend and a girlfriend that, that are living together come to the church. You know, I'm not going to kick them out in day one because they're committing fornication. But I will approach them probably in week number two if they've come back and address this with them and say, look, the Bible teaches, you know, you, you can't continue this relationship. Either you get married or you break this relationship or you get out of the church because I'm going to have to kick you out of the church if you continue fornicating um, in the congregation. And let me say this as well. Again, if I ever do kick someone out of the church, I will tell you. I will tell you that we've kicked them out of the church and I'll tell you why. I may not go through every little bit of detail, but I'll say it's because of fornic fornication or something. You know, it's because of drunkenness or something like that. Okay, I don't need to give you the whole life story and, uh, you know, destroy them even more than necessary. Because, you know, that, that's, that's God's way of, of casting them out of the church and let, letting Satan to, to destroy them. Now, is that the end of it? So someone gets kicked out of the church. I know I'm going a bit long, but I think this is important. Okay, if you can turn to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Because there is a process for restoration. There is a process to have this person that's been kicked out of the church to be allowed back into the congregation. Because isn't that what we want? Do we really want them out, attacked by Satan, for the whole, is that really the, the end goal? No, the end goal is we want them to be repentant. We want them to get right with God. We want them to get right with the church. I mean, back amongst us, fellowship with us, you know, you know, for us to be a blessing to them and for them to be a blessing to us, for us to be able to worship the Lord together. Isn't that the end goal? Of course it is. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. So this is another letter. This is the third letter that Paul has written to the Corinthian church. In verse number 5, he says this, but if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So he's talking about this man. If you read the whole thing, you'll understand it's the same man that he spoke about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 5. That he's saying this man has had the punishment and then uh, has taken his punishment. Look at verse 7. So that contrawise... Ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with, uh, swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. So this person, Paul is saying to the church now, you ought to forgive them. Why? Because this person has come back. He's suffered enough. He's suffered the punishment of Satan enough. He wants to get right with God. He wants to get right with the church. He's apologized to the church. And Paul is saying, you need to forgive him and you need to comfort him. You need to forgive him and comfort him. This proves that he was repentant at this point in his life and he apologized to the church. And if someone that is kicked out of the church comes to me and says, Kevin, I want to get right with God. I want to get right with you. I want to be back in fellowship. Praise God. Praise God for that. And I will get them to come and not only do they have to apologize to me, but I'm going to get them to stand up here and apologize to the church. 
And when that happens, you forgive them. That's it. You forgive them and you, it's behind us. We move forward. You don't bring it up to them again. That's not forgiveness. Once you forgive something, just the same way God has forgiven you for your sins, He's put them as far as the east, it's just from the west. We do the same for someone that's been kicked out of the church but brought back in because they've been repentant for what they've done. Okay, you don't bring it up again and we move on with our church. Why do we forgive him? Look at verse number eight. Wherefore I beseech you that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you whether ye be obedient in all things. So the reason I wrote to you 1 Corinthians is to see whether you're going to be obedient to the word of God. And they did. They kicked this guy out. Okay, but now he wants back in. Okay, verse number 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. And if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. So look at the warning in verse 11, the warning. So why ought we to forgive that person? Okay, look at verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. So do you see the role Satan plays in church discipline? First, you cast them out of the church so Satan can have his way with them. Okay? But if that person's repentant and wants to be back in the church and apologizes, but we refuse to forgive him, Satan's going to destroy our church. Do you see that? Lest Satan should take, get an advantage of us. So that's why. And you might say, well, that person's done such a great sin, I can't forgive him. Well, if you can't forgive him, then Satan's going to have his way with the church. We ought to forgive him because, again, church ought to be this protective hedge from Satan. Do you see that? So if someone wants forgiveness, you better forgive them. Okay, first of all, because it's, it's the right thing to do. Okay, because God's forgiven us. We ought to forgive others. But also because we want to protect this church from ta Satan taking advantage of us. If we have an unforgiving heart, an unforgiving spirit, that's an open door for Satan to come and destroy us. Okay, um, that's, that's what I had for you this morning. I hope that's something, there's been some things that you've learned there. Uh, let's just pray.